This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Rising rates, stocks are up, so are bond yields, and one money manager says that makes some dividend-paying companies more attractive, not less. Ford's detour, the automaker is halting all production of its very popular and very profitable F-150 at a critical time for that company. Staging a comeback, why demand is rising for a type of mortgage considered a villain of the old housing crisis. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Wednesday, May the 9th. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. The Dow records its biggest win streak in three months, rising for five straight days. An increase in oil prices sent energy shares higher, and that helped lift the broader market. And investors did not appear to be bothered by a rise in the 10-year yield back to the 3% mark. So here are the closing numbers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average advanced 182 points to 24,542. The Nasdaq rose 73, and the S&P 500 was up 25. Bob Pisani explains why today's market action could be a good sign for the bulls. It's finally happening. The broad market and key leadership sectors are breaking out of a downtrend. Bulls are starting to regain control of the narrative. The big cap S&P 500 and the small cap Russell 2000 are reversing. The S&P has risen nearly 100 points. The Dow more than 1,000 points since Thursday's lows. After a tough few months, the news has been better for the bulls recently. The jobs report last Friday indicated modest jobs growth with modest wage inflation. Earnings have remained strong, and guidance for earnings for the rest of the year have not dropped. Earnings growth will be slower next year, however. Finally, inflation remains moderate. Today's 10-year Treasury auction kept 10-year yields at 3%. April's producer price index, this is a measure of inflation at the wholesale level, saw core prices well within expectations despite somewhat higher costs for commodities. It's not just the S&P that's breaking out. Sectors that were market leaders early in the year, like semiconductors and banks and FANG stocks, they're all doing better. What's missing here is more volume on up days. That would be a sign the bulls are really getting enthusiastic. The highest volume days of the year have all been on big down days. None of the big up days has had any kind of heavy volume. Finally, here's an important point. Breaking out of a downtrend does not mean we are in a convincing uptrend. Keep in mind that the market traditionally has a very tough time advancing during midterm elections, though it usually turns around in November when the elections are over. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Well, with interest rates inching higher, investing for income can be tricky. So what do you need to know when it comes to dividend-paying companies? Joining us tonight is John Petridis. He's Portfolio Manager at Point View Wealth Management. Welcome back, John. Thanks for having me on. So Investing 101 says, uh, says when interest rates are going up, dividend-paying companies are pressured. But you say not always. Why? Not always. Well, it depends on the cash flow of the company. If the company is doing well, and if interest rates are going up because the underlying economy is doing well, that means corporate profits should be stronger, which means they should generate more cash to return to shareholders. So you want to look at a company's history of not only having a high dividend, but what's their history of growing that dividend over time. You also say that you have to be careful. You, you, you kind of divided it up into pros and cons. Mm -hmm. One of the things you need to watch for is a company's level of debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to buy a company's uh, stock for, because, simply because it has a high dividend yield. Right. You, know, you don't want to be lured into a trap because if they have a significant amount of debt on the balance sheet and if they can't fund that debt, well, then one of the first uh, sacrifices will be the dividend. So don't just go chase the higher yield because it's a higher yield. So let's name names. Mm -hmm. uh, you start with Ventas right. uh, and an assisted living company. Exactly. So the REIT sector, all of those sectors that were bond surrogates, you know, we've been looking for yield for almost a decade now. And those sectors that were stable substitutes for bonds have all sold off hard. So telecom, REITs, and uh, consumer staples and utilities. So Ventas is one of the largest senior citizen, uh, senior housing facilities in the country. Uh, they have near 6% yield. We all know that we're living longer, and that wave to, that, uh, to those type of uh, homes are, are continuing to grow. A name that a lot of people know, it's a household name, Haynes Brands. Right. And you say it, it, it has really increased the dividend on a fairly significant level and very consistently. Haynes, the stock is sold off because there are less, there's less foot traffic to the mall. So there's less impulse buying at big boxes for underwear and socks and those things. Mm -hmm. So the stock has sold off pretty hard, but, the, but it yields near 3.6%. Over the last four years, 
The company has grown the dividend 40 percent per year. So you're not now you're not getting you're getting a high yield and you have a company that has a history of growing the dividend. And finally, the company that used to be the one you look to first right. for dividends, it used to be the most widely held company out there, AT&T. Well, AT&T, the yield is over is close to six and a half percent now. The company, assuming they complete the deal with Time Water, will complete this transition to an end to end media company from being cell phone to content and own everything in between. So we like those three stocks. Do they have to complete the, the deal for you to like it this much? Not for the dividend, no. Okay. Yeah. Very good. John Petridis with Point View Wealth Management. Always good to see you. Thanks yeah, for thanks joining sir. us today. Senior. We turn to Washington now where there are new reports tonight that involve President Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, and some very big companies, including the drug company Novartis. Eamon Javers has more on the consulting controversy and the money behind it. In the White House press briefing room, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was asked today if the president is embarrassed or ashamed about any of the disclosures surrounding payments by large corporations to his personal attorney, Michael Cohen. I think that would be up to those individuals who make the decision to hire someone, uh, just the same way uh, that the companies that you work for make the decision to determine whether or not they think that you're qualified to serve in a position. That's the decision of an independent company and has nothing to do with the White House. Here's what we know as of now about the payments that were made to Michael Cohen in 2017 and part of 2018. A company called Columbus Nova LLC, which is a company that is independent of but linked to a Russian oligarch controlled firm uh, in Russia, gave $500,000 to Michael Cohen. Novartis, the drug giant, uh, updated its statement this afternoon to say that it had paid $1.2 million in a monthly retainer of $100,000 a month. AT&T said it paid up to $600,000, and Korea Airspace confirmed $150,000 to Michael Cohen and his consulting firm called Essential Consultants. Now, Novartis explained that ultimately their arrangement with Michael Cohen was fruitless. They said that Novartis determined that Michael Cohen and Essential Consultants would be unable to provide the services that Novartis had anticipated related to U.S. health care policy matters, and the decision was taken not to engage further. The company said, however, that it continued to make those payments to Michael Cohen for the duration of the contract because they felt they were unable to break that deal. AT&T sent a memo uh, to its employees today explaining its role in all of this, saying that Cohen did no legal or lobbying work for us and our contract with Cohen expired at the end of its term in December 2017. It was not until the following month in January of 2018 that the media first reported and AT&T first became aware of the current controversy surrounding Cohen. So meanwhile we've got new development from NBC News this afternoon reporting that a senior official inside the drug giant Novartis tells NBC News uh, that Cohen reached out shortly after Trump's election promising access to the new administration. Cohen and his attorney did not respond to NBC News's request for comment on that alleged promise for access. But here we have the very strange story of the president's attorney also selling access to insights about the president's thinking and approach to governance at the same time he's representing the president of the United States. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eamon Javers at the White House. Rising interest rates are also impacting the mortgage market, and that has home buyers trying to figure out how to navigate this incredibly competitive and pricey market. And as Diana Olick reports, that means more people have less skin in the game. Competition for the slim supply of homes for sale today means bidding wars, cash, and a tougher road if you're a buyer who needs to use a mortgage. Interest rates jumped at the start of this year, took a break for a bit, and then began rising again last month hitting the highest level in over four years. Last week, they actually fell back a bit, but that didn't help much. Mortgage applications to both purchase a home and to refinance a home loan fell. And home prices aren't just rising, the gains are getting bigger. So how do today's buyers who need a mortgage get in the game when the finish line keeps moving? They do more with less. The last 12 months especially, um, more people are putting less money down, 3%, 5% is becoming more of the trend and the, the more common than almost 20% or 30% down where it used to be 10, 15 years ago. More borrowers are also turning to adjustable rate mortgages, which offer lower interest rates but were widely blamed for the housing crash a decade ago. Today's arms, however, are much more conservative, as are the low down payment loans. 
there's always a concern about higher risk. It's all relative. You know, is there more risk on a 5% down than a 30% down as a lender? Of course there is. However, it's relative. There's a lot of layering risk. So you have to understand the person's credit profile, along with those mortgage insurance programs, along with the way the mortgage industry is today. It's so much stronger. Lenders are also banking on a strong economy that will keep home prices from falling. But at some point, prices will hit a limit, and the less skin in the game buyers have, the more at risk they will be. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. And the cost of building a new home in California is expected to go up after a state panel there today approved an historic plan to require solar panels on new construction. Aditi Roy is in Fremont, California for us tonight. Santosh Lakshmi Narashanam bought his home 15 months ago. He wasn't looking for a house with solar panels, but liked the idea of saving energy and some money on his energy bills, too. I would encourage everyone to think about it. And now everyone who wants to buy a new house in California might be forced to have solar panels. Under a new code just approved by the California Energy Commission, all new residential buildings in the state up to three stories high, which includes houses, apartments and condos, have to include solar panels. The Energy Commission says it would add $9,500 to the construction cost of a new home. But the energy savings over a 30-year period would be $19,000. I would say um, it would be a positive thing. The head of sustainability for KB Homes, which built this brand new community of houses in Fremont, California, says the company supports the new rule and that 35% of its new homes in California have solar panels. The California Building Industry Association also supports the new standards, as does the Solar Energy Industries Association. Sunrun, the largest residential solar company in the U.S., also applauded the decision. But the outlook hasn't been as sunny recently for the solar industry. Residential installations in California went down nearly 20 percent last year. And tariffs stemming from U.S.-China trade tensions could cost the solar industry up to 23,000 jobs. This as construction costs keep rising. And while the new rule could increase upfront cost of buying a newly constructed house in California, a state already known for skyrocketing housing costs, some homeowners like Santosh don't mind footing the extra bill. Trying to install them afresh is, is kind of more uh, expensive, so I would say go for ones which already have them in. The rule still has to be approved by the state's Building Standards Commission. If passed, it would go into effect in 2020. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Aditi Roy, Fremont, California. It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Semiconductor stocks were in focus at Nomura Instanet, which upgraded the shares of Xilinx to neutral from reduce. The analyst cites a more aggressive tone from management on acquisitions. The price target was raised to $70, and the stock rose 1 percent to 68.43. The same firm downgraded Broadcom to neutral from buy. The analyst cites a worse-than-anticipated outlook for wireless demand. The price target cut to $250. The stock fell slightly to $238.05. Meantime, Checkpoint Software's rating was downgraded to hold from buy at Argus Research. The analyst there cites execution issues related to sales. The firm also cut its earnings estimates for the company for this year and next. Shares of the cybersecurity stock edged lower to $99.80. Monster Beverage was downgraded to neutral from overweight by J.P. Morgan. The analyst expects pressure on margins to continue given the rise in input costs. The uh, price target was lowered to $52. The stock fell by 7% today to $49.11. Still ahead, Ford is doing what no automaker wants to do. It is halting production of its most profitable vehicle. Ford said late today it is halting all production of its popular F-150 pickup truck. A fire at one of the automaker's parts suppliers has stopped production of critical components for that vehicle. And it's the last thing that Ford needs right now. Phil LeBeau has details for us tonight. The F-150 assembly line is the heartbeat of Ford's truck business. And right now, it's in critical condition. 
What's the problem? An explosion and fire last week at a supplier's plant in central Michigan means it can no longer provide components for the F-150. And without those parts, Ford cannot build the popular truck. That means roughly 4,000 workers in Dearborn could be temporarily laid off. The United Auto Workers alerted members of a possible shutdown saying the company doesn't know for sure when or for how long we will be down. A shutdown would come just as Ford dealers are preparing for the busy summer sales season. And for Ford, the F-150 is critical to its bottom line. It's not only the most profitable vehicle it sells, it's also the most popular. On average, an F-Series pickup is sold every 30 seconds. For now, Ford has plenty of F-Series trucks in its inventory. So if there's a complete production stop for a short period of time, the impact on sales is expected to be minimal. Ford is working with its supplier to get production of those components up and running as quickly as possible. And while there is plenty of urgency, it is too early to tell how long that will take. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. The Department of Transportation is conducting an audit of the FAA's oversight of maintenance issues at both Allegiant Air and American Airlines. Allegiant said it welcomes any analysis of its operations. American said it was shocked to learn of the review and it stands by its strong safety record. Nonetheless, those stocks came under pressure in trading today. Walmart is buying a controlling interest in India's leading online retailer. The world's largest retailer has agreed to buy 77% of Flipkart for $16 billion. As we reported earlier, this deal gives Walmart greater access to that fast-growing Indian market, something that it has been trying to crack for several years. Shares of Walmart fell 3% today, making it the worst-performing component of the Dow today. Sears strikes a deal with Amazon, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Customers who purchase tires from Amazon will now be able to have them delivered to and installed by Sears Auto Centers. Under the deal, Sears said it will also sell some of its own tires on Amazon's website. Now, separately, Sears said it's continuing to take steps that it believes will improve financial performance. Shares of Sears jumped nearly 16 percent to three dollars and 20 cents. Meanwhile, shares of Amazon closed up about one percent to one thousand six hundred and eight dollars. Mylan reported earnings in line with estimates, even as weaker sales of its EpiPen allergy treatment hurt total revenue. Yesterday, the drug maker warned of EpiPen supply issues caused by manufacturing delays. But today, the FDA said it expects that shortage to be short term. Shares rose nearly 4 percent to 36.72. Well, the domestic box office success of superhero movie Black Panther wasn't quite enough to prop up attendance at the movie theater operator Cinemark. The company reported weaker than expected earnings, but revenues edged past estimates. Shares were off 5 percent to $36.78. Online lending platform Lending Club reported a surprise profit that was helped by an increase in loans. Revenues also rose and topped expectations. Lending Club shares gained 20 percent to finish the day at $3.40. Then after the bell, 21st Century Fox said the strength in its cable TV channels helped the media conglomerate top revenue expectations. Earnings grew but missed estimates. Shares were volatile in the extended session. They ended the regular session today down a fraction at 37.70. Also out after the bell tonight, streaming device maker Roku reported a smaller than expected loss and higher revenues for the latest quarter. Roku also said it expects sales in the current quarter and for the full year to soar past street targets. Shares of Roku were initially volatile after hours, but finished the regular day up nearly 9 percent to 36.08. As you know, companies make news all the time, some more than others. And whether it's good or bad, news can affect the stock. So what does it mean for you when a stock you own is constantly in the headlines? Joining us to talk about some high-profile names you may own is John Nigerian. He is the founder of the Nigerian Family Office. Good to see you, John. Thanks Great for joining us. Great to be us. with you, Sue. Thank you very much. So you've kind of labeled this sticking with it or leaving it, and you've picked three names for us, Nike, Tesla, and Facebook. Let's start with Nike. Uh, right. What are the what are the positives here? Uh, positives are hugely positive. Uh, Thirty four billion in annual sales, Sue. That is a huge number, and it's only growing. Obviously, one of the best brands in the world, Nike is. Uh, 
probably because of Michael Jordan, but there's a whole bunch of other athletes and some great product behind it. Uh, the other reason I think, Sue, is three billion of those sales came from China. So I think that shows you how much sales could grow in China because it's only one tenth of the overall sales. I think Nike's got a real opportunity here. And of course, we've got the World Cup, mm -hmm. which is right at our doorstep now. And that's another reason, I think, to focus in on this stock. And what you're doing is you're staying with it, right? Yep. This is one bill that I would stay with. Okay. Like Nike, I don't own it right now except for customers. Myself, personally, I don't own it right now. But as you know, I'm more of a trader than I am a buy and hold right. guy. Right. Then there's Tesla, which is, seems to be always in the news. Not always for good reasons, though. Right. Uh, last week, of course, it was Mr. Musk who got a little testy. Uh, with uh, some of the questioning that he got, calling them boneheads and so forth. We all know he needs to raise capital. I'm not saying they won't be able to raise capital, Bill. I'm sure they will. I think it becomes a little tougher, though, each time they have to keep going back to the well. And his reality distortion field is very similar to Steve Jobs, but without quite the same measure of success that Jobs had with, you know, sort of waving his hands and getting people to believe there was really something or that they could do something that they didn't think they could do. I love the product. I just don't think they can make enough money uh, in the short term to meet a lot of the Wall Street projections. And that takes me to that final point, which is, you know, it is a car company. Great technology. I'll give you that. Uh, but unfortunately, he's going to have to admit sooner or later that it's a car company. And when he does, I think the valuation gets hit pretty hard. So this is one that I would not be owning right here, Tesla. So you'd be leaving that one. Reality distortion field. I'm going to yep. use that. Uh, thank oh. you, John. <laughs> sure. You're very welcome. Let's move to Facebook. You have some positives for us. You're sticking with Facebook at this point. Why? Well, and this is one, Sue, that I bought uh, and I've held for months now. Love this stock. I could give you two and a half billion reasons, and that's about the number of uh, daily active users that they have on the platform. Uh, but that beyond those people on the platform, think about the one, one and a half billion people that use their mobile phones. Because, Sue, I think that is what every advertiser wants to touch because they can actually geolocate us uh, when we're carrying our phones around. So the fact that they're so big in mobile and the fact that both of these numbers are in the billions is why all the advertisers have to be with Facebook. So I don't know that there's really another place they could be. I think this is just, you know, the 800-pound gorilla. You've got to be with Facebook. It's the best way to reach people as they're going by your place of business with the mobile or when they're searching for things uh, on their desktop. All right, John, so you're sticking with Nike, you're leaving Tesla, and you're sticking with Facebook. Thanks Indeed, so Sue. much, John. Great to Thank see you. you. Great John to Nigerian see you. with the Nigerian family office. Bill? Coming up, the most valuable art collection ever sold at auction, at least part of it, coming up. On Capitol Hill, the Senate has forced a vote to restore the rules that govern the Internet, known as net neutrality. A vote is expected next week on a new resolution to restore the 2015 regulations. Those regulations banned blocking and throttling by Internet providers. The current FCC chairman reversed those rules. Well, some of the rarest art masterpieces ever put up for auction went for record prices last night at Christie's. The collection, as we've been reporting, is from the estate of the late David and Peggy Rockefeller. Robert Frank has been following this story for us. He's back tonight with more. To to the, the biggest names in art were on the walls. Picasso, Matisse, and Monet. But the name that captured the big auction at Christie's last night was Rockefeller. The sale of the top works from the Peggy and David Rockefeller collection featured 44 pieces that went for a combined 646 million, way above its estimate. 
There were bidders from 34 countries battling paddle for paddle and over the phones to get masterpieces once owned by American royalty. There were seven new records set for the artists, and there were cheers and gasps from the crowd throughout the one-hour sale, which was the largest ever auction of a single collection. The most expensive piece was Picasso's Young Girl with Flower Basket. That went for $115 million. The piece, while slightly disturbing and not classic Picasso, is from his prized Rose Period, which was sought after by museums. But the big moment of the night was for a Monet water lily painting, which once hung by the stairs of the Rockefeller's Westchester home. It was estimated at 50 million, and with fees, the final price was 84.7 million. 75 million, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for that tremendous bid. Here it is in, you have it. Sold to you, well done. Henri Matisse's Odalisque reclining nude went for 81 million, and a Gauguin estimated at 18 million went for 31. The winning bids for both the Matisse and Monet million. appeared to be from Asian buyers. All the proceeds will go to charity, and the Rockefeller sale rolls on with more than 1,000 other items the rest of this week. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. Wouldn't you love to know who the buyers oh, were? Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, most of them are going to be one of me anonymous uh, on those phones. Of but just amazing, this collection all in one place, and now it's going to different parts of the world. I can't wait for Robert's reports for the rest yes. of the week. Favorite the story of the year. Of the yep. Should we take another look at the final numbers idea. on Wall Street? The Dow advanced 182 points to 24,542. The Nasdaq rose 73, and the S&P 500 was 25. So stay with us. We're going to follow that story. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a wonderful evening. Save some money and bid tomorrow or something. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow.